So let's look at sliding window at the link layer first. In other words, you are employing sliding window only between two nodes A and B and this link that is interconnecting them has a bandwidth B. This is the link rate and the round trip time between these two is RTT. Now W is the window size that you are employing and I am specifying this in bits. So my first question to you is what is W? Rather what would you like W to be? We saw this before, you want W to be the bandwidth delay product to achieve maximum throughput. Now tell me if you are using this W, what is the maximum throughput that can be achieved between A and B? Well, this will be the link capacity that is equal to B because if you see here, this is one round trip time and within this round trip time, you are sending W bits and the throughput that you are achieving is W over RTT. This, if you set it equal to this, will be equal to the link capacity. Now tell me, what is the rate at which acts are coming? Now this is equal to the rate at which you are sending the packets because you are generating one act for every packet that you are getting and at what rate are these packets getting sent? This is dictated by the link capacity. So as you can see the spacing between these acts is being dictated by the transmission time of the packets that are being sent. Now if you look at the sliding window protocol, even if you were to set W less than this bandwidth into round trip time, the rate at which you are going to get the acknowledgements is being dictated by the link capacity. So as you can see here, here I am not utilizing the full link capacity, this time is idle. When I am getting the axe and thereby sending new packets during this time, the throughput that the sender is achieving is equal to the link capacity. If you see, I didn't do any estimation of what this link capacity is because my W is in fact less than this but still when I am sending the data, when I am getting the acknowledgements, I am achieving the link capacity. So these acts have this pro nice property called self-clocking where depending on acts, if you send out data, you are in fact achieving the throughput that is entitled to you. This W matters in the sense that during this time you don't want to stay idle, you still want to send packets. So this self-clocking where the rate of arrival of acts convey information about the link capacity is a very useful feature. What we have seen so far is over one hop, what if the sliding window protocol is being run over many hops as shown in this figure. So in this example, suppose these were the link bandwidths, what would you set your window size equal to? And what is the maximum throughput that you can achieve in this particular scenario? So if you did the calculations, you will realize that the maximum throughput that you will achieve will be dictated by this link which is the bottleneck link because this has the lowest bandwidth along this path. And you would want your window size to be set equal to the round trip time into this bottleneck bandwidth of 100 kbps. Because if you were to set to a value that is greater than this, packets will start to queue up at this particular router and get dropped because you cannot achieve more than this throughput anyway. Now my question to you is whether self-clocking still works in this context. So what is the rate at which acts arrive at the sender. What is it a function of? If you do the calculation you will see that this is dictated by the rate at which packets are being sent on this bottleneck link. So this figure here captures this. Suppose you are sending one kilobyte TCP packets between source and a destination. These are separated by a high bandwidth link, a low bandwidth link and an intermediate bandwidth link. I just made these a multiple of 8 so that it makes division simpler. And what is shown here is the transmission time of this 1 kilobyte packet on this particular link. As you can see this is a very high bandwidth link thereby the transition time is small. 
this is a low bandwidth link thereby the transmission time is large and this is an intermediate thing so it is in between this and this so what is interesting here is the spacing between the packets so here let's focus on router r1 so these two packets that were sent back to back come separated by the transmission time of 80 mbps which if you did the calculation will be about 100 microseconds so this is the transmission time of this 80 mbps link this is basically the separation between the packets now it will start transmitting on this 8 mbps link this is going to take roughly 1 milliseconds to transmit so the second packet even though it came right after 100 microseconds of the first packet it just has to wait in the buffer till this point where it again begins transmission now when you look at r2 the two packets the first packet has arrived here in other words this point corresponds to this point so both are the same point let me call it p1 p1 so this is where you remove the first packet and began transmission of this particular packet now the packet 2 is going to finish transmission here so that is where it is going to arrive so this point is the same and this time corresponds to that one millisecond which is the transmission time on this low bandwidth link your transmission time of the first packet finished earlier than that the link is idle it is waiting for the second packet as soon as the second packet comes it begins transmission now if you look from the perspective of this destination D, the first packet it received here and the second packet it received here, this spacing will be the same as the spacing, which in turn is the dictated by the transmission time of this bottleneck bandwidth. Now suppose D were to generate acknowledgements immediately as soon as it received the packet. So this is where it received P1, this is where it received P2 and this is the 1 millisecond which is dictated by this 8 Mbps. If it were to generate acknowledgement 1 and acknowledgement 2 and let's assume these acknowledgement packets are really small in size that their transmission time is negligible and as these acknowledgements go back they are going to preserve this timing so the sender is going to know what the bottleneck bandwidth is based on this timing that is the separation of the acknowledgements basically the rate at which acts are coming to the sender will be the same as the rate at which packets are being sent on this bottleneck link so if you see without doing anything really sophisticated just by sending packets back to back we have determined what the bottleneck bandwidth is based on the separation of the acts by the way this is an idealization we have not considered competing traffic so when competing traffic is there this preservation of spacing between the acts capturing the bottleneck bandwidth may not really hold but if the network is not congested, on average, this spacing does capture what the bottleneck bandwidth is. In other words, this is not a perfect estimate, but we do get some information about what the bandwidth of the bottleneck link is. Now, even if this bottleneck bandwidth varies with time, the acts are going to adjust themselves. In other words, if the bottleneck bandwidth increases, the acts will be spaced closer. If the bottleneck bandwidth decreases, the acts are going to be spaced further apart. So it is adaptive that way. Here is a bit of a paradox. Suppose I were to set my window size to be greater than the bandwidth delay product. This can happen because you are estimating W and at times your estimate may exceed the bandwidth delay product. So what is the sliding window protocol saying? The throughput as we saw before that you can achieve through the sliding window protocol is this. That is W over round trip time and this if you substitute here is going to exceed the bottleneck bandwidth but what is the self clock saying it is saying that you can only send out packets in response to this acknowledgements and they are capturing the transmission time of the bottleneck bandwidth so the maximum throughput that you can achieve is bottleneck bandwidth 
So what's happening? This is saying you can get throughput greater than bottleneck bandwidth, which is not possible by the way. Self clocking is rightly saying that you can achieve the bottleneck bandwidth. So what do you think is happening? The hint is in the round trip time. So when you set your window size to be greater than the bandwidth delay product, basically you are pumping in more data than the network can handle. So you are overflowing the pipe. In which case, where is this additional packets going to get stored? They will be storing in the buffer of some of these routers. Now if packets are getting buffered, naturally the round trip time they are going to experience will now include the queuing delay as well. So this bandwidth delay product was calculated with a round trip time when there was no load. Now when you exceed this capacity, you are basically going to increase the round trip time. So these acts that you are getting, this spacing no doubt is capturing the bottleneck bandwidth, but this round trip time that you are seeing is now going to include the queuing delay. In other words, when you are calculating this, this is RTT load. So this is captured in this figure as well. As long as your window size is less than this bandwidth delay product, your throughput is going to be dictated by the window size because in this case you are keeping the link idle for some time. The maximum throughput you can achieve is at this rate. Beyond this, if you increase your window size, your throughput is going to level off. You can't achieve more than the bottleneck bandwidth. But if you increase the window size further, now your delays are going to progressively increase. Not only that, the queue is also going to build up. So when you do congestion control, you basically want to work in this range. So how do we tackle the problem? Same idea as before, we still view the network as a pipe. But now we are going to estimate this bandwidth delay product. How do we estimate that in fact is the crux of congestion control. We will look into it in detail later. So as part of this estimate, we use a variable called the congestion window that tracks this bandwidth delay product. And just like the sliding window protocol does, we are going to make use of the self clocking to determine what the bottleneck bandwidth is and use the axe to clock out data. Well, this is exactly what sliding window protocol does. What is new? The new thing is after having gone through the problem motivation and all the subtleties involved in the sliding window protocol, you can now appreciate better what I'm going to tell as part of congestion control in the later video. So in the solution approach, we are going to follow these three steps. First, we will see how to get to this equilibrium that is filling up the pipe. Then we will look at conservation at equilibrium. That is, we don't want to put new packets until old ones are removed. And then we will look how to adapt to the path dynamics that is varying bandwidth delay product. So to summarize, congestion control is a very complex problem. We need to implement it in the context of the sliding window protocol. And we have seen that self clocking is a very useful feature which we are going to use to capture the bottleneck bandwidth. We also need to determine and adapt this window size such that not only don't you underutilize the bandwidth, but also that you don't congest the network. The actual details are up ahead in other videos.